Well, once again, good morning to everybody. Fifth Sunday of Lent, Passion Tide begins. And I'm acutely aware that we're another seven days nearer to that glorious time when hopefully we can meet together in our church building. And so I'm sure you'll join with me in keeping that thought in your prayers, hoping that it will happen and that the, the pandemic's not going to get worse, that will stop it. I'm going to ask Jean at the end of the service just to remind us about what's going on during Holy Week. Um, I'm sure enough notices have gone out, but it won't do us any harm. And I know how much work she's put in with other people to make sure that we have a right Holy Week, something that is right for us, bearing in mind the constraints. And in the meantime, a warm welcome to you all to this worship this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. Lord, direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we say together, Heavenly Father, we come together to bring our praises and love to you. We come to hear your word, to pray for the world that you have given to us, and to ask your forgiveness for the times we let you down. We pray that your Holy Spirit will fill our hearts with love, that we may always praise you. Amen. And the special prayer, the collect for today. Gracious Father, you gave up your Son out of love for the world. Lead us to ponder the mysteries of his passion, that we may know eternal peace through the shedding of our Saviour's blood, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now our first hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. For those in thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice. Rejoice, the King I sing. And so we confess our sins using words from Psalm 51. 
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Amen. Our priest declares God's forgiveness. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. And as is our custom, as best we can, let us offer one another a sign of peace. And so now we turn to our first reading from Hebrews. The first lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help in time of need. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. 
And now we sing, O oh, my Saviour, lifted from the earth for me. And now our gospel reading from St. John's Gospel. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip, went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. Well, good morning. I haven't uh, actually asked Jean and Alan 
But I suspect that when they come to write their sermons for us, sometimes the words just flow onto the page, but at other times it can turn into a bit of a struggle. And if I'm honest and just to gladden your morning, today's talk for me has definitely been one of the latter kind. If I was to have a text, it would come from the verse that next follows the section from Hebrews we heard earlier, and it's this. About this we have much to say that is hard to explain. Well, not an understatement in my view, and if the writer of this letter found it difficult, what chance do I have? But nevertheless, I'd like to look with you at two phrases that we find in that passage. This may just be my problem, but I confess there are times when my eyes start to glaze over and I begin to lose concentration. If faced with phrases like, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And quite frankly, that sentence without any background feels pretty meaningless. So that in turn leads to the risk that I then decide this passage really doesn't have any particular relevance to me. Uh, do understand I'm not suggesting for a moment that applies to you. So that I, I let it flow over my head for it to become simply a part of the service ritual for the day. But of course, if I do that, the consequence is that I so easily then lose sight of the truths that just a little digging can uncover and which in fact do have much meaning, importance and relevance to me. Well, as I said, this may be just my problem and I do apologise to those for whom this is well trodden and familiar territory and for whom no digging is needed. But just in case there are some others of you who, like me, also struggled a bit with what the writer of Hebrews, whoever he may have been, was driving at, please join me as I do go a little below the surface. And I fully acknowledge that with the writing of the complexity and depth that goes on through this letter, I am only scratching at the surface. Let's look first at the reference here to Reverend Melchizedek. I mean, whilst he's not centre stage in this letter, that place, of course, is inevitably reserved for Jesus. He is mentioned eight times. And because of that and the way in which he's referred to, you could be forgiven for thinking he was an important historical figure. But in fact, apart from this letter, his stage appearance is elsewhere on the verge of being non-existent. If we first go back a thousand years or so to the Psalms, in number 110 verse 4, we find this. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, which is, of course, exactly the sentence we heard quoted in Hebrews. That particular psalm was especially important for the Jews because it was regarded as one which spoke of the Messiah who would come, a messianic psalm. And of course, for the writer of Hebrews, that firmly foretold the coming of Jesus. So there's the first hint of why his name appears. But having used that quote from the Psalms, the author of Hebrews goes on to explore in much detail why he's done so. And to do that, he, like us, has to travel back a further thousand years or so and to the beginnings of the scriptures, which is where we find the Reverend Melchizedek in real life. There in Genesis 14, he pops up from nowhere. So one might justifiably hope for some significant exploit to be found here to explain his importance. He appears in verse 18. King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. Then he speaks in verses 19 and 20, and then he exits stage left, albeit not pursued by a bear. <laughs> That's it. Well, that feels a bit of a letdown and slightly disappointing, since with just those three verses at first, not a lot to go on. Yet actually this verse, verse 18, does begin to provide a basis for understanding just what the writer of Hebrews was driving at in drawing parallels with Jesus. Exciting, isn't it? Well, now we're told that Melchizedek was a king 
and reinforcing that point his name actually means king of righteousness and also that he was a priest of the most high god now immediately for jews that information presents profound difficulties because there's no way you can be both king and priest why because to be a priest you had to come from the tribe of levi a descendant of aaron on the other hand kings were all appointed from the tribe of judah the tribe from which jesus came and never the twain shall meet nowhere apart from melchizedek do we get a combination of the roles and that's how it shall be says the psalmist until the messiah comes and by the time hebrews is written the messiah jesus has indeed come and as our first hymn reminded us he is the risen and ascended king at the right hand of god and we know of course that he totally appropriately in his early life was from the tribe of judah but then how is he also a priest resembling and that's the description hebrews chapter 7 uses resembling king and priest melchizedek and what was the significance of his being so our passage makes it clear that the appointment of high priest is one taken up at god's invitation jesus takes on this role at the behest of his father for what purpose we know that in the temple the responsibility of approaching god and offering sacrifices was the province of the priests who were the only ones allowed in the holy section of the building kings were not permitted to enter even though solomon appears to have got away with it sometimes and further beyond that section it was the high priest and him only who had annual access to the even more sacred part the holy of holies where he'd meet with god hidden behind a veil of incense now the writer of hebrews is telling us using this quotation from psalms that now we have Jesus as Melchizedek before him, both a king and a high priest with that direct access to God. He is the channel, the intermediary between the people, and that includes us and God, enabling him to offer sacrifices on their behalf. Now there's actually so much more in Hebrews about what all this means and why Melchizedek's reference is so important but having scratched the surface of what lies behind that quote from the Psalms, let's just move on to another sentence in the passage. If you look just inside the door of St Martin's Church, as in so many other churches, you'll find a list of the great and good who've ministered here since the 13th century, some whose tenure has been quite brief, Others who were in post for better or worse for many years, although I note the list currently ends 26 years ago with the name of Richard Adams. A list of so many who will have influenced this community and the worship here, but also far as I'm concerned as a relatively recent incomer, simply names. And even for our most esteemed, long established village residents, head just a little way up the list from the bottom, and then for them too, these men, and they are all men, inevitably come just names. One thing is very evident from that list. Their time as vicars here had a beginning and an end, whether by death or moving on to pastures new. But let's just suppose for a moment that one of these gentlemen, let's say Edmund Parry MA, appointed in 1543, had escaped that outcome and our parish had never needed to replace him. Wouldn't it be so interesting to be able to talk with him about life here over the past 500 years? And just think, what would it have been like for the congregation to have the same vicar running the parish for all that time? I suspect that most, if not all of us, would shrink from that idea, at least in part for the good reason we know that nobody not even Jean is perfect. By the change of vicars, the church experiences different skills brought to the task and different failings. Not that I'm suggesting Jean has any of those. Any failings balanced out. 
But in Hebrews, we're told that Jesus, having been made perfect, became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Jesus with no failings and eternal. Unlike the succession of priests and high priests ministering in the temple, this man without failings was exactly what was needed to bring that list to a full stop. Jesus, in sharp contrast to all those gone before him, was to continue as a priest forever and become the source of eternal salvation. Again, turning on the pages to chapter 7, we find this. Now, there have been many priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus, the eternal and permanent, unique, divine yet human road into the very presence of God, where he intercedes for us. At the beginning of today's passage, the writer of Hebrews invites us because of Jesus and what he's done for us to approach the throne boldly, to approach with confidence. But that doesn't mean in a self-assured, self-righteous way. The reason we come is to receive the gifts of mercy and grace. Mercy is what happens when we don't get what we know we deserve. Grace is when we get what we don't deserve. Through Jesus, both King and Priest, we may approach God in confidence to receive both forgiveness and blessings. For that, we should indeed be grateful. And as we pass through Good Friday to what lies beyond, that gratitude must surely turn to assurance and to hope. Amen. And so we join together to declare our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. So in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. It was a year ago on the 22nd of March that I was leading our prayers in St Martin's Church on the last Sunday before the first lockdown. Who of us could have imagined that today we would still be in a lockdown? Let's pray together. Father God, we bring our prayers in the precious name of Jesus, our King and High Priest, in thankfulness that through him we are free to speak directly to you. For many, this past year has brought nothing but loss and hardship. And we pray for the many who have been bereaved as we come to the UK National Day of Reflection on Tuesday thinking of all who have died from coronavirus and all other causes. And we think now of those friends and loved ones that we have lost and pray for those who have loved them best.
Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for all those whose health has suffered through the pandemic, from the long lasting effects of COVID, or because treatment has had to be suspended, and for others whose mobility has worsened from being trapped indoors. We pray for those who have lost their jobs or livelihoods, whose hopes have been dashed or plans disrupted. For families who have struggled to cope in lockdown and where relationships have broken down. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. On the positive side, the lockdowns have brought some surprising successes and revelations. We give you thanks, Lord, for the many ways people have found of connecting with others, enjoying their homes and the natural world, and by being creative and generous. For all those who have sacrificed so much to help those in need, and for all the volunteers who have enabled the rollout of the vaccine programme in this country and abroad. We pray that much of the good that has been generated from tackling the difficulties caused by the pandemic will continue. We pray that lessons will be learned from any mistakes that were made in, in the past year by those in positions of leadership and decision making. And that there will be a strong desire for greater equality in our society and the will to make it happen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. As we look ahead to the gradual easing of lockdown measures, we do pray that it won't lead to a third wave of infection and that we will be able to safely enjoy the return to more freedom, to mix and meet up with friends and family. We pray that our economy will begin to recover and schools and colleges, shops and businesses return to some sort of normality safely. May churches throughout the country open their doors this Easter so that Christians can gather for worship at this most important season. And we pray for all preparations being made for services during Holy Week and on Easter Sunday. Help us all to continue to take care and consider others as we start to resume gathering together again. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. Our thoughts have been drawn this week to the vulnerability of women, to the danger posed by predatory men and what can be done to increase their safety and to teach boys and young men greater respect for girls and women. We pray that this will be effective and that women throughout the world will be protected from harm and exploitation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, we look forward in hope for a world able to live safely with COVID-19 and pray that all countries will have equal access to vaccines and health facilities. We pray especially for those living in war zones, in poverty and in areas of natural disasters. Thinking today of those especially experiencing flooding in Australia and that aid will reach them and their suffering will be alleviated. Move in the hearts and minds of those in positions of influence and power through your Holy Spirit that peace and justice may prevail. And move in our hearts and minds too, that your love will abound in our homes and communities. Strengthen and help us, we pray. Merciful Father, accept these, these prayers, prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. And let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And our final hymn, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. And so now before we ask Jean to give us God's blessing, can I just say thank you to all who've helped with this service and shared with us, to John and Alison for reading so well. It's always a joy to hear the gospel and the words of God read well. It's marvellous. We, and most of us, in fact, do that very well. Nigel, thank you. And thank you for teaching me two new hymns. I've not heard those before, so that was excellent. Peter, an excellent sermon as always. And Katie, some lovely prayers. We, we thank you all very much indeed. And so now I'll hand over to Jean, our priest, who will give us the blessing. So now we leave this space of worship. And while so much of the road ahead is uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is found closer to us than our next breath, binding us to one another until we meet again. In that knowledge, go in peace and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you always. Amen. Before we say the dismissal together, do you want to just quietly remind us, Jean, how important it is that we tune in to at least one of the services during Holy Week? Yes, uh, thank you, Alan. Um, I, I put on your email with the link um, what's happening from Palm Sunday um, all the way up to Easter Sunday. And I also think it's strange that you know, people think that 
to, to do Palm Sunday and then leap to Easter Sunday is the right thing to do. But to journey, to journey with Christ through Holy Week is a very special thing. So I would encourage you um, to try to get to as many of the Holy Week services as possible. They are different. Each one is different um, and very, very special indeed. And Palm Sunday, we can look forward to a dramatic reading of the Passion um, interspersed in between each act with beautiful music. And then on Monday, we have a meditation for Holy Week from Peter. On Tuesday, Joe is going to um, give to us a, a service of reconciliation uh, where we can think of um, ourselves, um, the wrongs that we might have done and asking for God's forgiveness. On Wednesday, Alan will lead us in evening prayer. Uh, on Monday, Thursday, um, again, it is very different to when we're in church because um, we can't do the things that we would normally have done. So obviously no communion, but some reflections um, as we think about Monday, Thursday and um, all of that means. And after the service on Monday, Thursday, we can go into St. Martin's Church, if we wish, between eight and nine, just for um, short prayer and lighting a candle, um, rather than doing the whole watch, which we would normally do. Good Friday sees a meditation at, at 10 o'clock, and what we find there is um, monologues, really, um, in the words of the voice of Peter, the disciple, Mary, mother of Jesus, and ourselves, and again, interspersed with beautiful music. And then the joy of Easter Eve, where we gather at Winterbourne Steepleton for the service of light with communion. So that's the first communion of Easter. Um, it's important that you book for that because Steepleton is a beautiful little church, um, as we can see, but um, can't hold many people if we're going to socially distance, which we must. And then on Easter Day, 9.30 at Compton Valence for Holy Communion, a Zoom service at 10. Um, Peter and Alan are kindly leading that um, because I'll be at Compton Valence. And then um, Martinstown um, will have a service at 11 o'clock. Winterbourne Abbas will have um, a gathering around about 10 o'clock, I think, uh, but outside. So lots to think about, lots to do. Um, lots to meditate on, I think, as we make this journey um, through Holy Week to the glory of Easter Sunday. Thank you, Jean. It occurs to me that, like all good priests, you meet us where we are and accompany us, us on our journey. And Holy Week is a time when we can actually say thank you for that. And on the journey with which you lead us through Holy Week, we can come and meet you where you are with Christ and journey with you. So I do hope as many as possible will join us for those services or some of them at least. Thank you. And so together, the dismissal. Let us go out into the world to live our lives for God, to follow Jesus and to listen to the Holy Spirit as he guides us that we may know Jesus more fully and live our lives for him, filled with his joy and love. Amen. <laughs>